Well, this is generally just, besides pronouncing it, it tends to be a very, very complex subject as well. Uh, so, before I carry on, for those that don't know me, uh, I have had quite a life journey. My life started in South Africa. I've lived in the UK for a long time. Now I live in a small country called Andorra. Uh, sometimes when I speak, people have no idea where that is. So, it's um, in a little principality between France and Spain, if you don't know that. That's some pictures from the area. It's beautiful in winter. I think it's even better in summer. It's great. So, if you want to contact me, there are many ways to find me. I generally just tell people to Google for YSB33R. You will probably find me. That's also my handle on Twitter and one of my email addresses. I've been involved in open source quite a bit. I've offered probably more than 15 Gradle plugins by now, maintain most of them. I'm also the person behind Groovy VFS. I've written the Crawley Front library for specifically for actually creating Gradle plugins. I've also done a lean pub backend for ASCII Doctor, which actually allows you to write an ASCII doc and then it will convert it to the appropriate markup so you can publish on lean pub. I also sit behind another Twitter handle called Daily Gradle, which generally is supposed to tweet uh, daily tips about Gradle, although I've been pretty busy of late, so I haven't really got around to that much. But you can follow that. It is sure to send up some um, tips soon again. I've done two books on Gradle, so that's just a quick, um, so to say, the marketing message. If you're interested in writing plugins for Gradle, those are probably the only two um, resources that you can actually find that gives you a structured way of doing that. I mean, there are quite a number of tutorials out in the market, but um, those are my two books. I'm actually working on a third one now, not on Gradle, but on setting up your continuous build in a DevOps pipeline. Okay, so just before I carry on as well, I've written this whole um, presentation in ASCII doc as well, styled by Reveal.js, it's built by Gradle. And um, I just find it's a very, very simple way of doing presentations, especially if I don't want to have a lot of effects, just a couple of words on the screen because the rest is just down to talking. Interesting thing is that I've actually found of late having had to attend a, quite a number of presentations that's not in English, like specifically presentations being in Spanish and Catalan, which is pretty hard. Um, people actually having slides up with a couple of words on them actually helped a lot because you might not understand everything that somebody is saying, but you can actually read on the screen and figure out what they're saying. Anyway, I said about doing a couple of things and a couple of years ago, I was really interested in being able to transfer files from just one system to another one using different protocols. So I wanted to pick files up from a system via FTP and drop it on another system via SSH. And I wanted to write as little code as possible. So that's two goals I set out and um, try to find ways of doing that because normally having to write that in any kind of scripting gets evolved. But I also wanted the code to be as similar as possible irrespective of the protocol that's in use. And besides that, I also wanted to have some flexibility, maybe in the use of third party libraries, and I didn't want to guess which third party libraries to use. That's actually what's pretty much set me on the way where the, the talk ended up being today. The other thing is I want to add a dynamic add protocols or file system types as we carried on. We'll skip that one. The one thing I actually found is working with some libraries is you had linkage issues due to like licensing, so I tried to avoid it as well. So looking at that, the first library is some people has actually used it up. I had a conversation last night with Kevin about using Apache Commons VFS. That's pretty much the great thing where my journey started. That's quite a useful library. It's got providers. Well, actually, I support rather than providers for quite a number of protocols. And uh, by default, you can actually use F 
FTP, SFTP, HTTP, a couple of other ones as well. It even has SMB support, but it's not published ever because SMB uh, libraries from SAMR are LGPL licensed, so Apache will not prove, um, publish anything that's linked to that. Uh, if you want to write with this, and it's generally relatively easy, but it gets bloated very, very quickly. You generally have to pick up what's called a file system manager. And then you can actually resolve files by URI. So for instance, if I have a RAM file system, I could just say resolve file f from this RAM file system, and you can then create a folder on the RAM file system, etc. That's the general quick you know, overview of what Apache Commons can do. Uh, it has a bunch of concepts, and these concepts carry over to Java NIO as well. As a, the concept, you have a f something that manages file systems, so you have to get hold of a file system manager. It then gives you the file systems, um, and the file system manager will actually look for providers to generate a file system. And then once you have something, you have a way to actually reference something on a file system, and that was called the file object. But the problem with Apache was that it has no standard naming. You have to guess which third-party libraries you have to use. And it changes behavior depending on which third-party libraries you use. So for instance, if you drop JSCH on the class path, you suddenly have SFTP support. But there is no, it's, it's not an easy way. You actually have to go read the documentation and find out how to put us there. And it's easy to forget. I do a lot of things where I have to pull things off HTTP. And I use it, and always the first time it fails because I forgot to put the HTTP Commons client on that. Uh, also, it uses some out-of-date libraries, so you can't do web dev and anything anymore because the Jackrabbit library is so old, um, and it doesn't work with new support, and then you can't upgrade VFS, etc. So it's it's pretty much a pain, and it doesn't see much love either. There are just a couple of bug fixes. There are you know, communications on the mailing list, but we don't really see more new releases. So a couple of years ago, when I really got involved with Groovy, I had to solve some problems. And this is the first big Groovy library I wrote, which is Groovy VFS. It uses Apache VFS underneath. And I also, at that time, also, because it's outside of the Apache project, I could add S3 and SMB as support, so you can actually use it to access um, files on, it, on any S3 file system or via SMB. And it takes care of some very, very unexpected Apache commons VFS behavior, for instance. In Commons VFS, if you copy a file onto a folder with the same name, it deletes the folder and puts the file name in place. And that can give absolutely bizarre behavior. You can just think what can happen. All right, so the idea of I agree with VFS is write code as simple as possible. And that's an example of what you can do today. Uh, I can, for instance, have a RAM file system. I can create a directory on it very easily after obtaining the VFS. And I can, for instance, just here say I want to copy from a source directory onto my RAM file system. And it works it out. So for me, having a DSL which can do things like that is great. But the issues with that is it gets all of the Apache issues generally. Um, and the file object lifecycle is a pain. This is discussed with last night as well. The kind of things that you have, you have to manage the, f the life cycles of when things get closed, and it can get very painful, especially if we work like with FTP file systems. You suddenly just end up with having like a thousand connections to the FTP server, and you get phoned by sysops or by a third party provider. Why are you dosing the system? And eventually, it just gets a pain and it gets too hard to, to properly work with. So, I was looking for something new. And I knew that JDK 7 brought NIO2, and I was interested in really working with that. And I started investigating it, and I found pretty much two things. There is only a basic zip provider that ships with JDK 7 or 8, and it generally is just read only. And I couldn't really find anything out there today that easily provides you some providers that you can use um, with NIO2. But the question is, do how many in this room are actually familiar how NIO2 works? One, so, okay, I'll explain. So the concept is you have the path, 
object. Uh, you've probably seen that actually in Java code. Um, you have a file system provider and you have a file system. So most people f are only familiar with path because by default you already have the file, your local file system being provided via path. But you can actually do a lot more. Uh, for instance, in conceptually you can provide something like this, a file system provider for FTP. We'll have two different file systems. Server 1 and Server 2 will be presented as two different file systems, but you will still have the same API in Java. Now, in reality, this is the only thing you would want to do. You want to say you have some kind of path, you want to get it. And for instance, I'm going to stick with RAM file system for most of these things as examples before we get further. I want to pick off that file that's on my RAM file system. Simply what to do is have some kind of URI, specify it, and it will give me a path, and then I can actually start working with that path, or instance, I can open a stream on it, etc. And as I said, the only default provider you have is actually a local file system. You can directly access it um, via file systems.default. So the lucky thing about this presentation is this, this time I can do it in Groovy. Previous time I had to do it in Java, so all of the examples were much more verbose. So you can actually get access to it and get a file. I mean, you can also have, if you have a file object today, you can say to path, which gives you the path object. And if you have a path, you can say to file, which gives you the local file object back again as well. And generally, what you could do is you want to load a new file system. You could, for instance, give it a URI and some options and it will load it for you. But the previous example is generally what you should only need because that's, in terms of programming experience, that's the least trouble. But we'll get back to this concept of loading a new file system manually later. You could actually also look at putting options in, so you could load a file system, put additional options in there. Uh, I'm not going to cover that further. That's the, if you have special cases, you could do that. What I have found out of practice, sometimes when you have to load things automatically, you can't easily do that. So that's actually, generally, my opinion, a shortcoming in NIO2. And then we actually get to something, do something proper. So we have a file. We want to load it up. Uh, we can easily go and create a channel on it. And it uses uh, standard NIO channels. If you're familiar with Netty or something like that, if you ever actually work with other kind of the, the modern NIO channels, you might actually recognize the code. The idea is that byte channels, et cetera, should be much more performant, and uh, it's, but unfortunately it is a bit more low level. You have to copy things in and out of them, generally via byte buffers. But you can also create streams over channels as well, which makes it a bit easier. And just to give you an example of which level is, if you anyone in this room ever still programmed in C++ or C? <laughs> yeah, it's a dying art, it seems. Okay. That's a real old school POSIX style um, C code reading from a file. The interesting thing, this is pretty much the same as that, nearly the same level, except this is even more verbose. So the pain, one of the pains of actually working on this level is that it can get a bit too verbose. But what we want to do is see if we can actually do something better. So that's where my journey really started. And I had to leave this door of comfort to go down the rabbit hole of NIO2. And the first thing I will say, it wasn't easy. But I decided, if I'm going to do this, I want to go and see if I can write all of my code in Groovy rather than Java. And whether, if when I've built this and I've built, one thing I've found with NIO2 is a lot of missing functionality once you try to write a provider. So I wrote a lot of common code. And I said, OK, I'm going to put that common code which you can extend from and reuse. I said, do it all in Groovy. And let's see if we can properly then extend classes from that in Java and Kotlin and see if it works properly without, you know, leaking too much groovy-isms from it. A couple of other things I decided from the start is let's compile everything statically. So my good friend up there, Martin, he doesn't like compile static stuff. So we, we sit on the, the opposite sides from that. Um, but I said, right, let's see. We do this, we see how many issues we get. Um, I decided not to like put any trace into public APIs because I don't want to, so basically one of the things leak any kind of very groovy specifics in there, so it's standard kind of things, let's just do normal interface, etc. And I even wrote specific test classes in Java and Kotlin that extended existing um, 
code to make sure that works. And I said, right, the other thing I'm going to do is my most important thing is I want to learn how NIO2 works, so I'm not going to write like any additional annotations. I think it can actually make life easier, but it's part of actually the learning journey. So the challenge of testing this can actually get out of hand very, very quickly. So you have to test at the unit test level. That's your basic code. Um, and once again, one thing I really learned from March and working with him at one stage is actually doing much better test fixtures. So I had to write quite a number of test fixtures for this because there's a lot of repeating kind of tests where you have to pull up files or create new kinds of files, etc. I wrote specific language compilation tests where we don't care about the functionality in the code, but I actually care that it compiles. So specific classes like, once again, in Java and Kotlin for now, that extends, um, implements the functionality. Most of the methods like return null, things like that. The key point is, does it compile? I ran into some issues, actually. And this is one I'm glad I actually did that. And one of the issues was I was using Groovy 2.5, RC1, and extended some Java classes from it, and it just didn't see some of the methods. When I switched back to 2.4, it worked. So there was definitely an issue there. I suspect maybe one of the reasons why it was, was Groovy 2.5 was Pop 2.4. That might have been kind of a problem. So there are things like that where I had to take care of. So that was really great. And when writing Groovy VFS, I actually had to write some test servers as well. So I had to write my own SMB server. Luckily, it was an old library I found, uh, which actually helped. But you had to write a whole SMB server in um, Java to actually test everything from here because it's a lot easier. Now it gets a bit easier because you could probably fire things up in Docker as well. By the time we started doing other things, that wasn't. so. Irrespective of that, you have to find up some test servers some other way, especially if you're going to write something else. It gets even more complex if you're going to start doing S3. And Gilliam may ask me about um, what about doing Google Cloud Storage. It's also possible, but you have to think about the complexities of how you're going to test this. Okay, so here we are today. Um, there is now a provider's project which I created. Um, you can actually go there. And obviously, I hope you're actually going to contribute to it in the end. But the project is you can go and have a look at what's done already. It's on GitLab. Um, and there's quite a bit of work done there. I've already released 0 0.1 of it. And in 0 0.1, I pretty much only support compressors. My journey, once again, started with, OK, I'm going to write a RAM file system, because that should be easy, right? I mean, you can simulate a very naive RAM file system by just creating a map of string and object. And the object can contain another map which shows a directory, etc. It looks easy when you start slowly start digging in, and you have to handle concurrency, and you have to think about how do files link back, etc. How can you traverse the tree? How do you create a channel into one of those files that you've stored? Um, and it soon gets out of hand. And I thought, okay, hold on. Before thinking about doing this whole implementation, let's go use something where the code exists but the provider doesn't exist. So I actually went off use of Apache Commons Compress, which is well tested. We know it actually works. And I mean, there's many projects that use that. So let's go put a provider on top of that. And the first release actually already supports gzip, um, supports bzip to LZ, LZMA, also supports XZ, which doesn't come from common, uh, part of it comes from Commons Compress and another third party library. But now the provider actually has all of those as dependencies, so you don't have to worry about which part libraries you have to pull in. You just have to pull in the provider and drop it on your class bar. Um, hey, oh, we have some documentation as well. So if you go to the project, you can have a link to the documentation. So each of the providers has written are actually documented. And if up here, you can actually see some of the kind of URIs that you can use. Um, and these are special with the compressed ones. For instance, you can just say bz2 or gz, call it a file name, and it will resolve it as a local file with a relative path and then work out the whole URI. Or you can give it as a path, or you can start concatenating um, schemes together. It's like the easiest one is just say gz colon plus file. But it has support if you can write, find a provider, for instance, to pull down HTTP. It will actually handle pulling down the compressed file and then decompressing it automatically. And that's the kind of thing you're actually looking at your kind of provider. So for each of these compilers, you can find if you go to the index page, or say you can actually find the whole release. And you can try today. So let's try a little demo. 
Um, that's a little bit of code using that. Um, and it's really like an evil little like, thing that unzips a GZ compressed file. And for this one, I'm just going to read, take a file name off the command line, put a GZ colon in front of it, and then load it with NIO. Um, that's why we use path.get, give it a URI, and then pretty much just put OpenStreamer, read all of the content, and print it. Okay, that's it is simple enough as that. So I have prepared this one at project earlier, and I am in the correct project. So I have a test file here. So that's the content of my test file. It is compressed at the moment. Um, just to actually see, and if you don't believe me, it is actually truly, if you run file on that same file, it is a compressed file. So let's run that little program I wrote. Which I cannot remember now. Okay. Right. Okay, so we're actually going to run, I'll copy that line rather than doing that. I just wrote like my own gun zip as Java as I said, and we can pass that file to it. Oh, right. And there your demo doesn't work because you passed the wrong file. Okay. Right, there's the file. And it has decompressed it. So if you actually have ever written code for Working with like Commons Compress, you can see this is really a lot shorter. So this is the kind of power that a provider can give you. Um, and this is what you can get with the libraries today if you already use it. But it hasn't stopped there. There's obviously a lot more work to do. And I've been working on a version 0 0.2, as I joke. And pres in working to do this presentation, I effectively wrote about 20,000 lines of code. So probably the most work I've ever done for a presentation. Okay. <laughs> right, so version 2 will support archivers, so you can actually look inside archivers, pull files out. Um, should support CPIO, tar, dump, etc. Uh, haven't made my mind up about zip because there is a zip provider and how we're going to deal with that. But it's very easy to write an additional zip provider. Currently, reading from archives work happily. You can create a new archive with content in it. Updating the archive is a lot harder. Um, it's currently in progress. I just couldn't finish that before we got to the conference. So it's in those last parts of testing. And this is one of the places where you now have to start thinking of how do you actually deal with things like this. Because with an archive, you effectively have to peek inside the archive, find a file, extract the content, and then you have to somehow write the content back. But you cannot write the content back over the same archive immediately because if you make a mistake or something happens, the whole archive is pretty much screwed. So you have to go through this process and think, what are we going to do? You have to stream a new archive. So although Commons Compress do give you the ability to do that, it actually means there are at one stage two copies of the archive on the disk. If it's a very big archive, it is going to be slow. That's the reality of life. Uh, but easy, this is, and this is a simple challenge still. When you get to some other kind of protocols, yes, I've scared people off of this because it's not the light-hearted process. But anyway, so there's a kind of thing you have to deal with and you can get it to work. So just as an example, I can actually now go and look inside a f archive and pull one file out if I want. And you can see that the URI is a standard kind of URI. You give the scheme, for instance, in the case we use CPIO, the path to the archive, and then the fragment. And the fragment then effectively points to a path again inside the archive, which is really great. You can also do double schemes. For instance, if you have a compressed tar, you can actually put a GZ first to pull the archive, put a tar in front of it, and it will compress it, and then know it's a tar, and then you can actually find a file inside. I think it's cool. Um, 
And once again, you're going to go through a thing where you're going to write something like this, and after a while you're going to find it might not be performant, and you have to start thinking about performance. The problem you always have to deal with first here is understand what you're trying to write and worry about the performance later. That's the same kind of thing we saw when we worked with um, um, Groovy VFS and Apache VFS. Okay. But then we had our first Groovy surprise. That all code works like you do in Groovy. So I thought, oh, I can go to the conference and just do it in Groovy console. I did this in Groovy console with a little grab and bang, it didn't work. Uh, and the same thing, I said, oh, well, maybe it's Groovy console, it's an issue. So I ran it from Groovy command line, same problem. And you had to write this workaround where you actually manually load the file system. The good thing is with a file system, you can specify an additional class loader. So you actually have to give the class loader of the script to load it. And then it works, and you can actually deal with it. For me, that's still a problem, because I want to write a code, obviously, as, as simple as possible. And especially if you want to write a Groovy script, you want to do it as simple as possible. So currently, that is still an issue that needs to be dealt with. So Jochen has asked me to raise an issue, which I will do shortly. I mean, we've discussed this on the email, Groovy email list as well. So if you might have seen the email, yeah, now you know the context. And I think you will agree that this code is a lot more verbose and unnecessary than it should be. Okay. Part of this whole journey was to actually say, well, I can do this, but it's not really a, a thing that you can do alone. So. If you want, you can actually help. You can try out the providers, uh, provide using your own project and give feedback or raise issues. They still need some help with the compressors because the basic things are done, so it's an easy way to get in there. We definitely need some support for a couple of other formats, which is up there. Um, I think especially Pack 200 is quite useful in certain cases. And obviously, still need quite a bit of work on the archives. Uh, as I said, we need TarZip, um, AR, and 7Z is, or 7Zip is quite a, a useful format, and it requires a bit more work than the other archivers. So there's a good place to get used to. But if you really want to jump in the deep, uh, it would be great if somebody tries to write a protocol provider. I mean, S3 or Google Cloud, provide, uh, Google Cloud Storage are two of the most common ones that people actually can use. And if you work, work with any of those APIs, you can see that if you just use plain NIO, the, the amount of code you write could actually be a lot less. And another place just to start joining the Slack community is very small. Uh, that is the, the URI to get there. And it's always useful to have somebody else that can actually help and write something. Okay. But the rest of the thing, I just want to talk about NIO in general. Actually, I'm going to stop, I'll stop at this point first and get you to ask some questions before I go into hard questions. So, Do you have any questions about NIO, anything that's really confusing, before we talk about the really confusing stuff? No, oh, okay. So they always say naming is one of the hardest problems. I can say it's not the only thing that's hard, not when it gets to NIO too. The first thing it says, you have to decide when you write one of these, what's a file system? Let's look at these two examples. You have FTP URI to the same server, different credentials to access it. The question is, is this a different file system? Same file system. That is a valid answer. I'll ask the counter, the counter question to that is, you have a local file system with access control, so you can also only see a part. So I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but this is the kind of questions you have to ask, <laughs> um, because it also affects your implementation. OK, that was the first one. The next one is obviously concurrency. Um, you might have to have multiple file system objects. You might have to deal with registering them. So you don't want to create one every time you access, say, an FTP server. 
Because if it's the same FTP server, irrespective of our previous example, it's the same it's the same kind of file system, same FTP server. You don't want to create a connection for everything. You want to deal with that as one file system. So now you have to deal with synchronized access. Uh, and it's not just protecting, you, you can't really protect the remote file system, but you have to look at protecting the opposite objects that's in the local memory. So you can, as I, to explain it a different way, if you're like going to take flight to an NFS, NFS server or FTP server, you can't actually control the locking on the remote side. That's not the point. When we talk about concurrency, it's really controlling concurrency within an, in a process that you, makes use of the libraries. And then get to the next kind of questions. So you have a remote connection. How do you deal with remote connection? Do you only open one connection and chain everything behind that one connection to retrieve files? Do you have multiple connections? How do you handle with queuing requests? Uh, there could be some libraries that help, but I mean, if you're going to write something from scratch, you really have to think very, very hard how you're going to handle this. And the same thing with if you're going to talk to a local file, or to a remote file system. So pulling little files are easy. What about pulling big files? So at some stage, you're going to have to pretty much cache them locally. Now suddenly you have to deal with writing a caching system or finding a li some kind of library that can actually provide caching for you. Then you have to decide what's my time to live in the, the, f um, the cache for files. When I decide to update it, um, etc. What's the size of the cache? And how are you going to configure it? Now earlier I spoke about using, you can say new file system, you can pass an options. Generally, that's not very practical, in my opinion. So you might have to find another way of doing that. The one thing f that might be possible, but is very, very debatable, is where the stuff like dependency injection would work here. Uh, the problem, I think, is that you have to think very carefully about that as well, because it's something that gets loaded very, very early. And it might rely on things that's, that's not there. So you have to think very carefully how you're going to do that. Another way is to provide things via system properties so you actually be change the behavior when it actually calls a method, not when it loads the file system. All things pretty complex and um, you have to, which you really have to think about. Okay, um, the language you're going to implement it in. So I said I went for Groovy because, you know, I am a Groovy person. But you have to think about a lot of things there. And I remember when this conversation started, with, I spoke with Mario a couple of years ago about this. And why, how do you deal with things that's actually as low level as this? Do you just write it in pure Java effectively and not have any dependencies? Because some people I complain if you would have the groovy jar on the path. And in the end, for me, the argument was it doesn't really matter because there's very seldom nowadays that people write Java code that isn't dependent on something else, so you can have dependencies in your class path. And I don't think really Groovy causes that much issue. I mean, if you can write it in Kotlin, you can have the same thing. You have to ship a runtime with it. If you want to write it in another language, maybe you should write it in Myra because it doesn't ship with a runtime. It's all up to you. Uh, you have to think about performance, the runtime run support. Uh, I mean, if you're going to write it in Scala, maybe you have to think about data marshalling. It's up to the person who writes it. For me, it once again was this thing, I want to have a solution first and I'll optimize later. So if somebody comes around and say, but it's all written as Groovy, well, my answer is fine, you can go re rewrite it in Java because now we've already done the learning. But that's not my point. I want to get something that works. Okay, now, if you want to implement your own file system, you at least need to implement those file classes that's on the screen. And you also have to drop a file, a meta information file, that actually has the name of the, f um, the file system provider in it. So if I'm going to implement a RAM file system, I definitely need my provider. The purpose of the provider is the one that will get loaded dynamically by the system. And it then gets called to create different file systems. You have this concept of a file store, like for instance on a local file system on Windows, you will have different file stores, one for every drive, C drive, D drive, E drive. If it's a Mac and a Unix file system, it's generally just only one file store on there. It could potentially say, well, I found an NFS system and creates a, a file store underneath, transparent to you. But that's 
when you normally write code against the interface, you don't see that. When you have to implement something, you have to think about it. Then you have to implement the path, and one of the things that the path has to do is it has to know how to in, um, interpret the URI, pull bits out of it, etc. And probably the hardest part is you actually write this byte channel, which can write things in and out. And that seriously gets complex to write it. It's not just writing, it's the, it's the creation of it, because you have to look at options. You have to say, has this been created for, for instance, write or read options? Is it a pen? Is it a truncate? Do you want a sparse file? Do you support the options? Um, and if you try to implement in just like a create function, it just grows. And then you end up factoring out into more and more methods just to do this. So it is, it is pretty complex. Um, and that's one of the reasons I always just say, and I get to recommend the practices, is I'll actually go back one first. Don't do this alone. It's better to have a friend to work together because, or a group of people because you can bounce ideas off each other. Just the kind of questions I asked already is typically the questions that come up. And it's very, very easy to code yourself into a hole or get so confused that you no longer know what you're doing. And you end up having to do, I have to sometimes just do stuff on a branch and then say, well, just throw the branch away and start again. Because it just it just gets too complex. Anyway, so what I would recommend is to do is to actually is I took a couple a little bit of a hint from what the people did with HD Builder NG in that you can actually decide what is the implementation classes underneath. So option of HTTP builder, you can now decide whether you have want to use core Java, um HTTP components or OK HTTP. And I thought, well this is actually really cool if we can do this. You can provide a a provider for a scheme, but you also put the name of the underlying library into it. So for instance, you could actually put some Maven coordinates in there and then say at the end, HTTP builder ng, etc. like that is there. I could do it with the provider now. So the providers that I've written all go like NIO, then GZ, it's the scheme, it says it's a provider, and then there's another name in there which says commons. So I know that one is implemented with commons. If I implement one with a different library, I just put something else at the end. So it's easy to recognize when you look at the jar names or at uh, artifact names when you browse something like Bintray or Maven Central. Just a little little thing that makes life different. Uh, well, that's what I pretty much discussed. This is what we actually do. Um, the other thing to do is, is to be clever and try to support double barrel schemes. Luckily, that's now a bit easier. I wrote a core library to actually help you actually work this out, and it can actually split things up. And it can say, oh, I want to be passed as there's another scheme underneath there. Let's go find that provider first. And then, like, what it will do underneath, if you open a channel on your, like, on the JAR scheme, it will say, oh, there's an FTP provider. Go find a channel for the FTP thing, load in the file, and then process it with my own classes. It means there's things you have to think about very, very carefully. But with a little bit of core libraries there, it makes it a bit easier. A um, couple of other things is just simply, don't spring any surprising behavior. Go back to all the Apache Commons fingers. I still don't know why they did it. I've lost the first time ever I lost my whole um, source repository because I just played around in a, in a right and suddenly my whole source repository was gone. But if you have to do things, I always document the behavior specific to the file system. For instance, in all of the ones now released, if you look at the documentation, it will tell you, for instance, which is how would a move operation work, or it will tell you the move operation is not supported by this file system. So you have to write all of that down, make sure it's in the docs. It just helps. That's the kind of thing sometimes you just have to discover things, like if you write like Apache Commons documentation, you don't actually know always what the behavior is. So it's really useful to set those behaviors out in the docs, and possibly actually test it as well, include it. Again, don't do this alone. And I will repeat it. So I would definitely like people to help, so I need some friends. So if you're interested in doing it, you can always talk to me. Um, well, we've got a couple of minutes left. So let's ask. You want to have questions now? Yes, Martin? That's right. <laughs>
I, I googled a lot for that um, and tried to find stuff that's open source. There wasn't something easy. Um, I think there was one or two maybe in some libraries, but you can easily pull it out. There was a lot of discussion on the Apache Commons group about it, but never ever, nobody ever did it. And that's why I just started done it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. This is far too much work. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know what the reasoning was or the group it created where they came up with that, the way it's done. The, my feeling is there was, there were good ideas in it, but there's too little implementation, too little support to actually make it easier to implement stuff. So you actually, to some extent, end up with a white elephant. Um, and I would totally agree with you on that, that it is too complex. Uh, it could potentially do with some simplification, but that's a this different story on its own. Uh, and the problem sometimes we try to simplify things and we don't realize actually what people were thinking about additional additional complexity at the time they were creating stuff. So you could go off and do something and realize, hold on, these guys were thinking about more stuff than we were thinking of. So there are two sides to it. Kevin. Well, if you're going to use that, that or like FTP4J, it takes care of the protocol side for you, but you have to think about things like concurrency locally and how you actually map what you can say, that set of APIs onto the NIO2 APIs. Even like the ones that's already in VFS, if you look at what a VFS interface is, you can't just do a one-to-one -one mapping there. So big part up front is to actually think through what you want to do and then Actually, so start writing a test. Say, this is what I'm going to pull, and then start working it backwards. The only problem is you can't just write one of those five classes on its own and start with that. You sort of have to write skeletons for the five classes and then start filling in bits. And I just, in those cases, I just actually wrote a lot of classes, put exceptions in them, so that I could work through things, and then I try another test, and it will throw an exception at some, some stage, because you can't remember through everything that it goes. And I say, oh, I still have to go implement it. Um, and I even wrote, the first ones, I wrote a bunch of issues on GitLab for each of the methods. So you have to implement this, you have to implement this, you have to implement this. So I can remember as well. For I might actually test stuff would never went through a certain path as well. And then you will get caught at later. So there's a lot of pretty much groundwork you have to do before that. But yeah, the thing is, obviously, you want to find a protocol library already that's, that does most of the work so you can spend your time thinking about the translation. Questions? Anything else? No? Oh, yeah, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Yes, there's actually there's quite a number of interesting things you can do there. Um, obviously, what you want to have is kind of the kind of file system mapping, because if you just want to do a get on a URL, it doesn't really make sense to map it to this kind of thing. A good example is, for instance, let's take Artifactory. You can get all the files in an Artifactory repo, etc. So there you can have a kind of thing where you could actually map the REST API in there, which then says, oh, well, I want to list all the files. Um, you open a directory stream and it gives you all the files. You can do stuff like that, which could actually be quite useful. Um, 
also, if you could think about things like where you know there are certain kind of websites, HTTP websites, where we can actually pull down listings on files. Those are easy. Uh, the other ones, I mean, in Apache VFS, there is a, an HTTP support, but it can't list anything, for instance. So you have to know the file exists. And what it actually normally does will send a head request first, find out that the file is there, and then pull it, which really breaks certain things. So I think you can't head things coming off GitHub. And I ran into another website as well where you couldn't do that, so it just breaks. So you have to think about things like that you want to do. So when you get into HTTP world, you sort of have to write a generic one. We have to wait, find some way of actually maybe writing some additional support or options that people can turn behavior on and off. OK. Good. Thank you very much. You can go through. <laughs> well, you have the URIs there. You can go and look at the homepage and the documentation, etc. Uh, I hope to hear from somebody.